Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Nicola Barrett, Chief Corporate Learning Officer at Emory Executive Education at Grimm's Meadow Business School. And I'm really pleased to have you all with us today uh, for Business Over Breakfast. Our focus today and next week is on helping you and your organizations gain new insights into how to increase the efficacy of your marketing efforts and understanding customer habits in this time of pandemic. And boy, do we need uh, all of the insights that we possibly can, can get. Um, today's session is on the modern marketing organization and is based on very recent uh, research that is featured in the current uh, November, December issue of the Harvard Business Review in an article entitled, Is Your Marketing Organization Ready for What's Next? Our faculty guide and the researcher behind this work is Goizueta Business School Professor of Marketing Practice, Omar Rodriguez Villa. Prior to his career in academia, he held leadership positions in marketing at the Coca-Cola Company, including as the Global Vice President of Integrated Marketing Communications and Integrated Marketing Director for Coca-Cola China. So he uh, not only has the uh, sort of the academic chops, but he has some um, um, uh, extraordinary practical experience uh, working for one of the biggest brand names um, on the global stage. His research uses a combination of ground theory and economic methods to understand the impact of macro environmental changes on the growth capabilities of firms. He studies how environmental and social sustainability considerations are changing the nature of growth activities and as well as the capabilities that define modern marketing organizations in their pursuit of growth. And it is this research that we're going to hear about today. Something I did not know about Omar, but it doesn't surprise me, is that he also serves as a principal investigator of a coalition between private and nonprofit organizations that is formed to conduct a research study of barriers to growth impacting Latino owned businesses in Georgia. So Omar, I think that's going to be a conversation uh, for another time, but uh, um, I, uh, I was intrigued by that. This morning, Omar is going to share his findings from the research that he's done on how both new and legacy firms are evolving their marketing capabilities to compete more effectively. Um, he will discuss insights about the main challenges that managers face as well as introduce a new method to design a marketing capability agenda grounded in both new and foundational skills. Um, as with all of our uh, Business Over Breakfast webinars, uh, he will talk about some of these observations uh, and then take questions at the end. So please put those in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen and our team will do their best to get as many of those questions to him as we can. So enjoy the morning with Omar, and I look forward to continuing the conversation next Thursday morning. Thanks, Omar. Great. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for making time to spend a little bit of your day with, with us. Uh, I'm really excited to share this, this work with you. I, I'll go, you know, I'll give you an overview of, of the research we've done. And then at the end, we'll, we'll go into some questions and I'll give you some information about if you're interested in more information, I can I'll give you some sources for, that you can use. Let me jump, jump in. And actually, um, I'd like to start the conversation with this picture because this idea of designing a modern marketing organization, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, through our research, we feel like this picture illustrates what the issue is. There is uh, clarity in the mind of many CMOs on the potential of marketing today, enabled in no small way by technology and data, but also um, challenged and sometimes empowered by issues of uh, sustainability and community and social issues, both of which need to be taken into account. So the vision of what's possible is clear. How we get to that vision is not. And, and that's kind of what this picture shows. It's like all the pieces of a potential iPad, I know what I could do with that new technology, but I just don't know how to put the pieces together in the, in the best way, right? And, and before I move further, I wanna recognize the fact that this is not work that I just did by myself. It's work that I did in close collaboration with a research team, uh, two other professors, Sundar Bhattwash and Neil Morgan, and two practitioners, highly experienced practitioners, uh, Shubhu Mitra and Peter Schelstra. And the five of us bring uh, very different uh, complementary skills to the equation. 
And we're also we're supported uh, by a grant and, and research support with, uh, from the Mobile Marketing Association. And so let me jump in. I can give you this idea that the issue is how do we put the pieces together? And I'm showing you a picture of all the different topics. And actually not all, I'm just giving you uh, a taste of what the full choice set of options that are coming down the, the desk of, of many chief marketing officers and marketing vice presidents and, and brand directors uh, in terms of things that they need to think about and consider. Uh, you know, one of the CMOs that we interviewed, he, he worked at a, at a retail firm, told us, I, you know, I feel like there's just so many things calling for my attention that my, my organizational priorities are being set up by the last email I get from my CEO or the last email I get from a board member who reads something in Wired or, or Fast Company, hey, this is how somebody X, company X is using machine learning for you know, customer research, what are we doing? And suddenly I need to assign somebody to go pursue that and, and you start adding that up and, and it creates a lack of clarity in, in how to operate. And, and really the, this is actually the core of the issue is we have an increasing set of opportunities for how to configure a marketing organization that creates more value for customers and for the firm and, and, and drives growth. But how to think about that configuration is not as clear anymore. Um, now there are three approaches that companies have uh, used that at least that, that we can summarize in, in our article. The first one is thinking about the, the transformation uh, almost as an exercise in retooling or reshaping, right? Like, um, and we see this very often. Uh, there are there are many uh, many new options uh, uh, of, what, of things we could do with marketing. So the question is, what should be our structure? Right? And and many managers sometimes start there, like are defining the problem as a problem of structure. Who where should things report into? What should I insource? What should I outsource? And that is a necessary condition to operate well. I, I don't take that away. But the question, and I'll come back to this in a minute, is when do we ask that question? Okay. The other one is, is think about transformation as acquiring new technology. And even though technology is an essential part of, of the modern marketing organization, is not an exclusive part of it. So there are other things beyond that that need to be taken into account. The, the second one is generational perspective. So that is thinking about, you know what, becoming a modern marketing organization is, is moving from old ways to new ways or from adopting more of an East Coast marketing, which is sometimes understood as more brand management to West Coast mass marketing, which is sometimes understood more as kind of the, the DTC, new technology firms type of marketing. And the challenge with this way of thinking about it is that as we have worked through with companies, in fact, the modern marketing organization is a, is a blend of some foundational skills and some very modern skills. It is not a from two. It is not, I, I'm no longer gonna do care about uh, brand management and I'm only gonna do this. It is actually, and this is part of what makes it difficult because we need to figure out a way of combining things that are, have been with us for 20 years and continue to be important with things that are completely new. And lastly, uh, sometimes companies uh, take a, a distributed approach at, at becoming a more organization. And by that, I mean, they assign the responsibility to different areas in the organization. And, and then you end up, and I remember you know, one of the companies we interviewed uh, alluded to the fact that they had over 50 different uh, kind of transformation initiatives going on at the same time in this one business unit. It's a large one, large, large business for them. And, and really it was difficult to have a line of sight into what was all being changed and transformed. And as a result, again, contributed to lack of clarity on how to operate. So we think that if you approach it in, in one of these three ways, uh, oftentimes company ends up adding verticals in their organization, right? You know, I add a MarTech team, I add a media team, I have a content team, I have a performance marketing team. And individually, all these verticals make sense. And some of them are new and, and there's truly new work and they have their own KPIs and they are creating value. But collectively, what we hear is that the organization feels this way. Like there's a lot of people sitting on one side or another, really wondering, you know, how do this all come together? And where is my role in this overall system that we are upgrading, right? And this shows up in a number of different tensions. Large, um, large concern with uh, lack of clarity on roles, 
which is not necessarily a new issue in marketing. There's always been some lack of clarity and roles depending on the firm, but this is a, is a, a level we have not seen in the past. A concern that the work of strategy is uh, being eaten by the pursuit of technology. And, and in fact, there are so many other people that said, you know, um, data is a strategy, right? Like we, we don't need strategies. Like, and then there's created tension between really, uh, I mean, th there may be some short-term gains of following the data, but uh, how are we thinking about how we're gonna win in the future? And where is that work being done? And what should be uh, in-house or outsourced is another big uh, tension and, and, and decision that's you know, not as clear. Uh, last one I wanna mention is uh, this marketing divided. This, this, because sometimes companies frame the transformation as old versus new, there are some foundational practices that are finding themselves having difficulty getting resources. For instance, uh, activities surrounding brand management. And, and then in, in tight competition with activities uh, known as performance marketing, which is one of the newer disciplines that have come up of the, of the technology firms. And that tension is, is not constructive for growth. Like, like you need those two activities to actually work, work together. And many of the, of the leaders that we interviewed talked about the fact that they recognize that but the people that work in those activities are so different, right? The computer scientists with the economists trying to, to find kind of common ground. And, and sometimes that's, that becomes uh, really difficult. So that, again, add to the lack of um, operating effectiveness in the, in the overall organization. And lastly, it's just this general sense that it's not that we're standing still. Like we are changing, we are adding new capabilities but it doesn't feel like we are changing really the way we, we market, we go to market, we seek growth. We, we seem that we're just changing things, but uh, we're adding things that we're not necessarily changing the, the way we operate. And in fact, in our, in our last survey of close to 500 companies, we found uh, in large legacy firms, about 20% of, of the marketing leaders said that they were satisfied with the operating effectiveness of their organizations. Um, in, in more uh, newer technology firms, the number was maybe 10 point higher. But the point is that uh, there's a large degree of dissatisfaction of how marketing is operating today, even though it is probably operating its, its best environment, given all the tools that it has to be more accountable, more agile, and more effective, right? Which really begs the question that the issue is an issue of, of organizational design. And this is where our, you know, our research took us in terms of proposing um, a better approach. And, and it really is as simple as this. So instead of thinking from kind of top down uh, and framing the issue as a problem of organization structure, um, but meaning you know, what should be the right structure for my company? What should be my right structure for the right structure for my, my function? And start asking from the bottom up. What is the mission of marketing in this firm? Now, let me stop there and say, what, what do you mean the mission of marketing? <laughs> Why are we asking this? Well, the reason is that marketing in many firms, not all, of course, but in many firms, marketing has lost clarity on what its job is because many of the tasks of the function have been distributed among different areas, different uh, functional areas. Some of the marketing work sits maybe in, some, in a digital team that sits outside marketing, that the kind of the formal structure of marketing. I know other ones may sit with the, you know, marketing technology activities may sit with the um, CIO office or chief technology officer. There are some aspects that need to connect with, with legal. And, and the point is that marketing is, is less and less um, a function and more and more a coalition of people that work in different functions. And the marketing leaders need to figure out a way of actually rallying this coalition, forming this coalition and aligning it so that it can operate in a way that can contribute to growth in, uh, collectively. And that started with having clarity of mission and what we call in the article, having a value proposition for marketing. And we think in the past, this was not necessary. The value proposition of marketing was well understood and fairly consistent across companies. But today, even if, I, if we had an opportunity to have a conversation, I would have started by asking you, what you know, give me an example of a great an example of great marketing work. And a lot of us would probably think of things related to advertising or social media, and that is that is the, what is in the mind of many people. But in reality, marketing is much broader than that. 
right? So we need to really understand what is marketing, what can marketing do in a given firm in this moment? Let's define what its value prop is now. And from there, what capabilities do I need to deliver on that value proposition? Once I have the, the answer to those two questions, the answer to the structural questions comes back a, a lot easier than if I don't have clarity on that first mission. So let me take you through how we, we suggest you, you think about this, this mission question. And, and so step one is selecting your, your mission or your value proposition. And, and we got to this by organizing and doing text analysis on, on the more than 120 interviews we did with marketing leaders and, and CMOs. And one of the lines of questions that we asked them was to reflect on what was marketing today uh, for them? What was most critical, right? Um, and, and one line of question, one line of answers could be described by this quote. And this was from uh, one CMO. And she said, you know, when I think about what marketing is today and, and what, what's important, uh, if you can't really have a conversation about pixels and attribution models, you, you're a marketer of the past. And this is the same CMO that, that when I ask her, what, what do you look for in marketing talent? Her answer was, I'm, I'm looking for coding skills. I'm not looking for creative skills, right? So clearly this is like the computer science view of marketing. And it's, it's, a, it's a way of describing uh, marketing and creating value through marketing that was invented by the technology firms and uh, the D2C firms of the last 10, 15 years and very much uh, operating in digital channels. Now, when we started this project, uh, we thought that that was actually the destination. That was, the, that was the, the modern marketing, right? Then we started, we, we heard from a different set of CMOs and marketing leaders from different industries, and they, they focus less on that. It's not that they ignore that, that, that is a necessary condition for success, but they, they talked a lot more about eliminating pain points, increasing convenience. They talked to customers as guests, as guests, and you can think that this is more you know, service industries. So they had a different orientation for how they thought about the value that marketing creates for the firm and, and how to contribute to growth. And then we had a, another set of, of marketing directors and, and CMOs that, and this is just illustrated by one quote from one uh, CMO that when I asked him, uh, you know, what do you think about what, what's important in marketing today? He said, I can, let me tell you about the future, not just today. I'm like, wow, okay. And uh, he said, the future is great stories well told. And if you know some of you that maybe are, are been in marketing for a while, you probably have a similar reaction to the one I had, which was, hold on, wasn't that the answer 20 years ago? <laughs> right? Like it wasn't that the way we understood marketing 20 years ago. It's about storytelling and, and kind of uh, image-based uh, messages. And 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 I asked him this, and he said, uh, well, the, the fact is that the technology and the analytics is enabling us to go to market faster and to be more efficient. But at the end of the day, if we do not have a compelling brand meaning, uh, you know, empowered by stories that really differentiate our products, we, we won't be able to compete at the level we want to compete. So he was making a distinction between kind of the value of, of meaning and relationship with customers and the tools that you may need to, to execute that today. And initially, as I, as I mentioned to you, at the beginning of the project, we, we started, we thought that, Maybe, maybe the modern marketing is defined by the new marketing, the one that does, is done by the technology firms. And the challenge is just moving everybody kind of into that direction. We, we started to evolve that, that way of thinking the more we talked to more directors and more CMOs about what was necessary for them to drive growth. And we began to see uh, that these three different quotes or illustrations are really illustrative of three different capability types. We, we call them uh, capability stacks. Um, and one of them, the top one, the one that's kind of the computer science view of marketing, we are calling that exchange value, creating exchange value. And that really, a lot of the companies we spoke about and we spoke to when we studied centered on seeing marketing as enabler of transactions, right? And, and their, their view of growth is through the lens of conversion, acquisition, and getting increasingly faster and better on how they, they get there. And they are using uh, machine learning and AI uh, to, to, to do so. 
And this, you know, the way they compete is through micro targeting and hundreds of, of value propositions and different segments and all managed in real time. It's a it's it's a capability that it's available to more some industries more than others. Definitely part of the way of, of competing today. But our point is that it's not the only one. It's not the only way. So we have the second stack, which we call creating experience value. And this is more about driving growth by increasing convenience and enjoyment uh, across the journey. Now you could you could do the conversion and acquisition with the first stack without necessarily uh, addressing customer pay points around, around the, the journey, or you could do both. And, and frankly, there are many, many new companies that actually focus on those too. But I think the important thing that I want you to consider is that the experience value, or what we call the experience stack, is a separate set of capabilities from exchange value. Now, they are interdependent and they may be, um, they, uh, they complement each other, but they're distinct. And lastly, the, the low one in the bottom, we call engagement value. And this is all about enhancing the meaning of your brand, expanding the meaning of your brand to support your ability to grow in more categories, in more services, particularly as companies try to become more and more platforms of brands covering different categories where you really need to manage that brand meaning strategically. And today that's not done only through storytelling. That's also done through community formation of customers and through the integration of societal benefits and social issues and social activism in brands. So there are modern ways of creating meaning and driving engagement value. There are modern ways of driving experience value and there are definitely modern ways of driving exchange value, but there are also some foundational ways of doing so. And the engagement value storytelling is still here, it's still relevant, you know, figuring that out and, and how to do story making as well, that, that's also part of that capability. Now, I would like you to now consider these three different stacks, not as something that you all need to have at the same level, but as different as a framework to guide a, a strategy for how to compete. So let me give you an example. Giovanni is a brand, it is one of the companies that was in our study. And for, through our lens, we think of them as competing primarily on engagement value. And in our interviews with their CMO at the time, you know, he talked of the fact that in the food industry, particularly his direct competitors, um, they were all focused on price and taste and the offer, um, but none of them were looking and were considering the importance of design, aesthetics, culture, sustainability, to the extent that they could. And he thought that that was their edge that really doubling down on being the most distinguished brand on those dimensions I just mentioned, were gonna be the key for them to grow and outpace the growth of their peers. Now that is a brand that's actually competing primarily on engagement. They also of course manage the experience and yes, they have sales teams and they manage retail customers and they have online channels. Uh, so therefore they, you know, they manage of course the transaction, but to a lower extent. Now, if you think about the, another option is competing on the basis of experience value here. One of the cases we, we studied is the Delta, Delta in particular, um, and how they have used, I, I don't know if some of you have had the experience of, of flying with Delta when we could fly, when we were offline <laughs> eight months ago, um, and, and notice how they evolve the use of their app as part of our traveler journey, right? From the beginning, early stages, like the first, when it first came out, it was primarily about giving us access to our boarding pass. And it took us a while right, to, to eventually adopt that behavior, but we convinced ourselves that was actually more convenient. And now think about where, what other moments in your traveling experience have they leveraged that app to reduce pain points or enhance convenience or enjoyment, right? For instance, you know, the ambiguity or the concern of our luggage, did it board the plane or not? Well, they eliminated that because now they tell you immediately. Um, the thought about, oh, how, well, how's the traffic on the way to the airport? They tell us that now. The thought about, you know, how long are the waiting lines and security? Or how far is the gate? Or actually I'm sitting at the gate and I really would love some coffee right now. Where is the nearest Starbucks? And the app tells you. All these different ways by which they have used digital solutions to identify and then resolve 
more and more pain points across our traveler journey. That's what the creating experience value is about. And why is this strategically important? Because now if I change airlines, now it's no longer the miles I'm not gaining by traveling with another airline. Now it's also an experience that I've gotten used to that is so optimal in the other airline. So it creates switching costs, right? Uh, so it is a, is a brilliant move, we believe, on the, on the part of Delta, but it illustrates really way what it looks like when you're competing primarily on experience value. And then uh, on the last model, you have a company like Just Fab, um, a D2C uh, fashion um, retailer that you know, manages hundreds of targets and, and, and hundreds of offerings in real time through machine learning and AI, very strong performance marketing, we, at least at the time when we studied them, their view of the engagement work it was uh, and brand meaning that, that was not really as much in their radar, right? They, they had some of the basic elements there, but really their focus was competing and winning through an exchange value mode, driving conversion, driving transactions. So when you put them all together, what we argue, what, what I want you to consider is that these are really different ways in which you can compete in the market. Um, now, how does this relate to designing a modern marketing organization? Well, th this is this is the bridge. So imagine if you decide to be a branded platform and compete like like Choban on the basis of primarily on engagement, right? So think of it like my major and minor, given that we are in a university setting. <laughs> so your major would be engagement, maybe your minor would be exchange. And um, if I know that, it gives a lot more clarity about what capabilities I need to prioritize because they're going to be the ones around engagement. And then once I know those capabilities, I know who I need to hire, I know the skill gaps that I need to assess, I know the type of agency or marketing partners I may need, the type of research I may need to do. Do I need a chief creative officer? Well, I might need one if, I, if I, that's how I'm competing, right? So it brings a lot of clarity to talent, to process, uh, and, and frankly, to technology as well, because technology cuts across all three. The last thing I would say is that these positions are not static. So we see companies building their capabilities and, and maybe legacy firms, maybe more CPG firms of the past as, as technology embedded and, and got um, introduced into more and more marketing activities, they found themselves primarily competing as the, as the pyramid, more engagement and less exchange. And competing in exchange in a modern way requires access to you know, customer level data in real time. It's, it's not something that many CPGs have, but over time they're building that capability. Adidas is a good example of a company that has done that. Nike is also. On the other side, you have the digital natives that enter the market either with a very strong exchange uh, capability or an experience capability. And some of them over time have actually built an engagement capability. Airbnb comes to mind as an example of that. The company that was primarily initially more driven on engagement and experience stack, uh, I'm sorry, exchange and experience stack, and eventually through their uh, social work, their community work, they have strong signal very strongly the fact that they're understanding the value of community building across customers and sustainability and social issues as part of engaging uh, their customer base. And becoming a three stack marketing organization, which is, we think is possible, but it's really difficult. So the issue is identifying where are you today and, and what is your next move kind of, kind of way. Now, that is the, the left side of, of our framework. That is one way of thinking about uh, the value that marketing could create in informing that value proposition. But that's not the only way that a marketing organization can create value for the firm. Um, there's also the, what we call the right, the enablers, right? Um, and there are three that we highlight in our work. The first one is strategic value. This is no, no surprise. Now, what has changed here is that in the past, the, the strategic value that marketing created would focus on, on things like identifying new customer segments, identify, defining value proposition, uh, identifying the opportunity for new product development. Uh, but beyond that, uh, there are new opportunities for growth embedded in issues like business model design, revenue streams, monetization of assets. These are new tasks that are of strategic nature that could be part of the value that a marketing organization creates for a firm. So in our, in our model, we include both those foundational activities as well as some, some new ones to indicate this. This is actually the scope of what the strategic value that a marketing function could create. That doesn't mean that it is what it should create in your firm right now, because some of those activities may be done by another function, right? 
but some of those activities may be blind spot, maybe meaning not done by anybody. I and mean, that could be a, an opportunity for marketing to create more value. The second one is um, operating value. And this one is, in, is, is heightened by the fact of the diversity uh, of different experts and techniques that have uh, become part of the way marketing is done today. And uh, let me just give you a quick example of what that looks like. We have here kind of two competitors in the same industry uh, selling uh, a very similar product, but through a very different model, right? At least initially, right? We had Harry's as a direct to consumer kind of startup disrupting the market. You could add uh, Dora Shape Club and a few others into the same group. And then we have the incumbent, right? The, the heavyweight champion, <laughs> Gillette, right? So, so when, when Harry's entered, they were distinct, they were growing, but you know, small, started taking some share away from, from Gillette until Harry's left their e-commerce DTC only model and started to get distributed via Target and Walmart. Then their, their sales really took off. Yeah, I mean, they were growing before, but uh, exponentially. Yeah. Now, to compensate for that, Gillette launches their on-demand uh, subscription service and begins to offer similar um, benefits and uh, similar attributes to, to Harry. So now they're competing head to head uh, more closely. Uh, you, in the past, we would have seen these two moves as just a channel extension. Like there, there is not a, it doesn't really disrupt that much the operations of a marketing organization. But in reality, what you have here is two very different models of competing that are having to coexist inside the same company. And it gives, it ends up resulting in operating asymmetry. So what do you mean by that? Well, the indirect model, the one that Gillette became market leader on, is a slow moving model. Slow moving in terms of data, particularly information, right? You need to wait weeks to get data from retailers or not retailers, from Nielsen, <laughs> uh, uh, to, to know how your sales are going. Uh, the direct model is a fast model. You're getting information on how, you know, sales and how things are moving minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. That by itself leads to a very different way of thinking about um, evaluating performance, planning, uh, allocating resources, right? Um, second, um, the indirect model is more vertical, meaning it operates around campaigns. Uh, I'm going to do something in the summer, then I'm going to do Super Bowl, and then I'm going to do Thanksgiving. And so, so the marketing organization sort of centers around these moments, these waves of activity that come in and out of the marketplace. And budgets are allocated that way. And there are some things that stay, you know, some retail activation stays, et cetera. But, you know, the, a lot of the budget is allocated. That way. The direct model is more horizontal. It's, it's continuously pursuing the acquisition and conversion of customers, right? There may be a few things that come in and out, but it, it is a machine that's always on uh, kind of way. Um, the, also in terms of the organization design, the indirect model relies more on outsourcing of, of um, skills, agencies and services. Uh, the direct model relies more on insourcing, more, uh, more talent embedded inside the company. And part of that is because they are relying very heavily on speed to, to execute on the information that's coming their way and their opportunities to, to optimize it. They think about brands very differently. So on the indirect model, not, not all, of course, but many companies in, the, in that model think that you need to build a brand in order to accelerate your sale, right? So brand to sell. And it is, if you invest in the brand and you grow that connection with customers, then actually that translates into growth. When you talk about to the direct model uh, kind of mindset, it's actually the opposite. You need to sell to brand. You need to put your product in people's lives, have them use it and use it often and use it again. And over time, they're gonna come to like it and eventually maybe even love it and talk to other people about it. And then you're gonna measure your brand attributes and you're gonna see you have a very strong brand, right? So that's, that's kind of the, the, a completely different approach at, at actually addressing that issue of brand. And, and lastly, the indirect model deals with market level data and the direct model deals with customer level data. So the direct, the direct model sometimes looks a little bit more like a B2B right firm uh, with um, a level of CRM activity that's not always as possible in the indirect model. Now, 
when these two models are competing against each other, uh, is one thing. But when they, these two models coexist in the same organization, that's when the operating effectiveness issues arise because it's very difficult to allocate resources, let alone get people to collaborate effectively when they're really operating with such different, not only tools and techniques and information, mindsets about how growth happens and what's required. That's why that second, that, that, that fifth area, operational value is so critical. And in there, we look at issues like definitely organizational culture and, and yes, incentives, but of course, uh, workplace technology that allows for more efficient uh, collaboration and coordination. And of course, marketing technology, which is so essential to everything you do on the, on, in marketing today. And the last piece is about knowledge value. And knowledge value, um, it's always been part of the way uh, marketing creates value for the firm. Uh, knowledge value is, you know, marketing was one of the ways of, of, of describing the function was it represents the voice of the customer, right, in the room. Well, that, that's still the case. Um, the, of course, the difference, and, and in many of the, the answers that when we ask um, the companies we study, what, what is one of the biggest difference today in how you manage marketing, the, most people said data. But most people talk about data in terms of the size, how much information we have, or the speed, or the new skills requ required. I, I need data scientists now, I didn't need them five years ago. What was more interesting to us is that beyond that, there were other people that actually started seeing their relationship with data very differently. And from being consumers of information that were, was purchased by research companies to being creators of sensors and signals that would give them an advantage because they're able to get new metrics and new measures into the customer experience or the purchasing uh, process. That um, that maybe their competitors might not have, and, and an example of that is is this work by Coke. It's called the Freestyle Machine. It, you might have seen it in some in some retail uh, locations, some restaurants, particularly QSR. And the question is: Is it a vending machine or a data machine? Right? And it, and it's both. Right? It's a, it's an enhanced vending machine. It gives you over a hundred combinations of flavors, and you can get your your Coke with vanilla and cherry and blackberry if you like. But at the same time, it sends real-time data on those flavor combinations at you know, very precise geographical locations, time of day. Uh, it doesn't connect to individual purchaser, but it gives enough data for taste profiles and how they vary by region that allows Coke to get a new type of insight into product development, R&D, right? And they have actually used that information to launch new versions of Sprite in certain parts of, of Texas and the south of the, of the US. So that, in a way, is a, is a system that gives them, it's, it's like a new sensor in the marketplace that gives them an advantage if their competitor doesn't have. So that's some of the new aspects of, of managing knowledge uh, as a modern marketing organization. And, and when you put it together, this is what we argue is, um, are, is the choice of right? You think about this framework on, these are the six areas of value that a marketing organization can create today. Embedded in this uh, are some foundational activities as well as some very modern activities. Uh, embedded in this are some digital activities and technology-led activities, but also some issues of sustainability, both environmental and community, as well as the relationship of the brand with relevant uh, social issues. So you have both. Uh, this is not, modern marketing is not just about new technology, it's also about understanding the new sociology of, of the consumer landscape. Uh, now, what we've done is, explore and, and, and create a taxonomy of what are the capabilities underneath each of these areas of value. So choice number one is, what is my value proposition? Meaning which of these areas am I gonna focus on in order to create value for the firm? Choice number two is what capabilities do I need? So we now, and this is one of the aspects we described in the article, where we have identified the core capabilities embedded within each of these areas. So if you wanna be really strong at exchange value, you need to be really strong at conversion, at personalization, and at prediction. And within each of those three, then there are additional specific uh, activities that you need to be able to do. And eventually it builds a map like this. And I know it's probably not legible, but you have our six areas of value with um, uh, 72 capabilities in total, which we believe is the most comprehensive taxonomy of what a modern marketing organization could do. Uh, not necessarily should do, that's a choice that each company makes or that it could do. And, and, and then the decision is, is, okay, what matters most, right? 
So well, you know, one of the things that we are helping companies do now is think through what is the right configuration for, for, my, for my firm. And what you have in front of you is a map of a technology company uh, we work with. And then the orange uh, kind of uh, shade is the importance level of those areas of value to their growth in the next two to three years. And this is uh, data that we collect from, uh, from uh, talking and surveying uh, the large, a large population of managers in their marketing community and actually related stakeholders. Uh, so it's important that this data is not collected based on just the opinion of a few people, but based on the collective opinion of a large set of experts inside the organization and partners potentially outside. We then have in the, in the blue area, the, uh, uh, the current level of performance in those capabilities. So immediately what should jump to your attention is that there are some places like this one where the performance and the importance is very close. So in those places, we basically say you have good fit. You are where you need to be. And there are some areas where there is a big gap between importance and performance. That right there begins to give you an indication of where should you focus your attention, right? Because uh, if you decide that creating knowledge value becomes, is, is one of the ways that marketing is going to create value for your firm, it's going to be part of your value prop. And in the context of data creation and management, there are these specific areas where you have a large gap between important performance, that becomes the opportunity for you to focus on. Now, when we did also, this is another example for a CPG company, very different map, uh, a very different um, set of uh, fit levels between, the, in this case, much stronger capabilities and engagement than in exchange, which was the opposite from the technology firm that we saw earlier, and more, a stronger fit in more traditional capabilities and weaker fit in some of the more modern capabilities, more the analytic based and digital based capabilities. So those insights get are very quickly to, to assess from, from this type of work. And eventually how we think, uh, how you use this to, to make decisions on what capabilities to prioritize in the design of your, of your organization is by doing a, a fit analysis, a fit assessment. So basically you're mapping the performance level of each capability with how important they are to your growth in the next two to three years. And it's important to qualify the timeline because it takes about two to three years to embed a new capability in a mid to large size organization. Uh, it doesn't matter if that capability is tech driven and it, if you're buying a system, it just takes time for it to eventually translate into action and yield results. Um, so when we map, this is an example of one of the companies in, in our research um, we, you can then calculate a general fit uh, level of how fit is your organization right now relative to the value proposition that you decided on, right? So in this case, the fit level is 65%, and it gives you a metric that then you can track over time, and you can, uh, you can evaluate uh, how well you are improving in managing uh, the, de the, the development and the design of your organization. And also that this fit number matters uh, because it's connected with growth. And this is data that we're, we're currently doing. Uh, we have in this data set 348 companies that have participated. And what we're finding is a strong relationship between higher fit levels and in, in the uh, indicators of growth in those firms. So we think that this, this um, uh, fit indicator can become uh, you know, a very important metric to consider relative to organization design, which Brings me back to the beginning of our conversation. Part of the challenge is that organization design is a decision area that unlike many other decision areas in marketing, which are increasingly driven by data and information, organization design is a decision area that is lacking data and it's lacking clarity of strategy, right? And that's kind of what we hope our free research does, it, it, that it brings a framework that gives clarity to make strategic decisions and it provides data that enable to inform those decisions to, to make a better design. I'm gonna skip those three and, and I'm gonna go just to summarize. So how to design a more marketing organization? We think, uh, you know, start by identifying what, what is your mission over the next two to three years? Where are you gonna create value? What I, that was gonna help you see what you're gonna lead, where you might need to support, not lead, but support because it's managed by another function. And frankly, where you might need to get out of the way because you should not be involved because the organization needs to move 
with efficiency and agility, and sometimes we need to collaborating well is actually not collaborating. Um, second, assess the fit, and that will guide the priorities for your design. Um, I'll leave there, I'll stop there. Uh, if you're more interested in this work and you wanna learn more, um, our article is now published in the Harvard Business Review, and we go in, uh, into a lot more detail on, on the ideas I just introduced. But I'll stop there and open it up for questions. Omar, thank you so much. Really mm -hmm. um, has been fascinating information and um, such a great deal of thought and uh, time went into this. Can you share with us how and why you got started uh, on this work and how it's being used and received in the marketplace? Yeah, so I'll start with the why I got started. I, I've been uh, passionate about uh, organization capabilities and marketing in specific things for many years since, uh, since I was uh, in that global uh, IMC role at Coke um, back in the early 2000s. And I did some research work while I was a coach, looking at trying to understand why some business units grow faster than others. And I took a capability lens into that. So what, what is it about the capabilities of some business units that enable faster growth? And, and all of that to me eventually comes down to the fact that when an organization is not well designed, there's a huge human cost, uh, not only a financial cost. So there, there is a, it impedes growth, uh, it's hard to see because the counterfactual is not available. So you may be growing at 5%, but you could be growing at seven, but that's hard to see. But what's easier to see is the frustration, the, the lack of engagement, the careers that are cut short or the growth in people that don't happen, that doesn't happen. They don't get developed to their fullest potential. Um, so, you know, I, we, we are motivated by that aspect as well. We, like br helping bring clarity to organization design eventually means people are kind of working to their best uh, in more places. And you know, I think that's, that's important work. How it's been received so far is, uh, you know, we've gotten a lot of uh, interest in the work by, by the industry. Uh, we have been invited to speak at um, forums like this one and uh, some companies have all those to see if we could help them. But, but more importantly, I think uh, the work is, is beginning to catch some attention by people that are in a position to take action, right? Because as academics, we, we propose, but we can't, we can't do from our position. So I hope some people will take, take action. Another question for you, Omar. Um, the strategies that you shared, the examples were mostly B2C. Mm -hmm. um, can you give examples of B2B companies using different strategies? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I will tell you that right now we focus our research on B2C. Even though we had some B2B representation, we decided to, to start with B2C. We had to narrow the scope in order to really understand the issues well. So our pipeline, our research pipeline for next year is to extend this work into B2B. So you're very uh, right to, to say that, you know, the, the work right now is more B2C oriented and, and it is by design. Uh, hopefully next year by this time we will have uh, the equivalent on, on the B2B basis. That I don't think it's going to be dramatically different, but certainly there are some capabilities that are, are likely to change. Thank you, Omar. You touched on the importance of the wiring between a coalition of different areas impacting the marketing organization. How do you anticipate this would impact PL ownership within the organization? <laughs> um, interesting question. I think um, let me let me answer that question by how are we seeing like uh, some of the best wire organizations get there? And we saw organizations rely on culture and trust interpersonal trust. What one company in particular, that it's a well-known company, a um, large tech company, they actually instituted the measurement of uh, trust as a, what we are calling KBI, a key behavioral indicator. And they um, measure trust at the end of the year in the annual reports of people. Like I, when I work at Coke, I never, in my annual report every year, I was measuring you know, my numbers and my performance, but I was never given feedback on, hey, you're not building trust with certain areas, right? And it was fascinating to us to see how they prioritize trust in uh, as a KPI of sorts 
and, and measured it among individuals and promoted it. And of course, when we asked why, the answer was in retrospect, obvious. Yeah. You can't operate a complex system with speed and agility if you don't have trust. It, when trust goes down, what goes up? Contracts, which not literally, but meaning more time and effort to coordinate, to agree, to align. Um, when trust is present, then issues like PNL ownership become less of a barrier to the collaboration that's needed. Because I, me as a PNL owner, trust that you as a non PNL or, or owner, but helper in my process, understand my issues and see what are my drivers that I'm worried about. And you're not pushing me to do things that are against my own metrics because we, we share them. So they, I think that is creating an environment where these greater levels of trust can, can occur. And, and that takes us down to softer issues, right? Issues of, of human relationships and, and uh, organizational culture, which we all know are essential, but notice that they have not gotten the, the main attention. You know, the, the attention is going to technology and data and analytics, uh, not to these issues, which are so central to enabling the, the collaboration. Another question for you, Omar. How frequently are you seeing manufacturers who ran an indirect strategy moving to a more direct one with the rise of e-commerce and in some cases, like sleepy industrial products, the inability of current distribution to transform to meet it? Yes, yes, great question. Uh, very frequently. I think that's in the mind of every, every legacy firm. Uh, now, they, they use terms like uh, digital transformation, um, but you know, in our view of the world, what we see them pursuing is not just the acquisition of technology and, and digital tools, but we see them pursuing is the ability of creating value in new ways across these, these three areas, right? Creating better exchange value, creating better experience value. And I think it's important to see it that way because it keeps you connected to the reason why you're acquiring all the technologies in the first place. And it also keeps you connected to the value to the customer, not only the value to your firm, yeah. Now, uh, I think the, the challenge ultimately, particularly for legacy firms, is the data. Is, and, and you see them uh, adopting you know, e-commerce, as, as you rightly suggested in the question, trying to embed more direct-to-customer relationships, even through their communications or through their offers or through their loyalty programs or putting in place CRM platforms, all of which is basically strategies to do the same thing, being able to build enough of a customer level data set at, you know, at a pretty granular and, and frequent basis that allows them to compete on that, on, to create on that better exchange value. Uh, companies that have done that really well, uh, that come from a legacy trajectory are, with, as I mentioned earlier, Nike and Adidas, they both use a lot of their communities, community strategies. So think about the role of engagement in building customer communities in actually establishing that direct to consumer relationship that eventually enables them to get the data they need to drive better exchange. So the stacks are, are connected, even though they are distinct. Omar, for um, smaller companies that have less resources, which force, force more focus, did you um, study size of marketing organizations? And is there a minimum size required for this to be relevant? Or might your approach be a one size fits all? So, we included some, some uh, smaller companies in the sample. And what I, in my conversations with some of them, what I will tell you is that it, it may even be more important because uh, they, it is more essential for them to choose very specific areas to focus on because they won't have the resources. Uh, and frankly, trying to do work in multiple areas could become a significant distraction. So let's say you're a technology-based firm that you're starting you know, selling direct to consumers, it's exchange value, that's it. Focus on that. Engagement value, experience, experience value, maybe there are some elements yet you need to manage. Uh, and engagement value, leave it for two years from now, right? And, and just, just focus on doing great at, at at least matching your peers on that, right? 
So yeah, I think it can provide clarity on when to what type of organization you need. And it may be smaller, it may be more nimble, it may be just focus on one thing, and you're consciously not doing other things because it's not the right time for you. Last question, Omar. Can you uh, share the emphasis between exchange, experience, engagement? How does it differ depending on the stakeholders? For example, driving student recruitment versus philanthropic support. That's an interesting question. I've not thought about it from that perspective. But um, I think it goes back to what, what is the nature of growth in your organization, right? Let's say if I'm, if I'm an NGO, uh, uh, you know, part of my growth is driven by executing my mission in the marketplace, by delivering the services I'm designed to deliver. But also part of it is you know, recruiting or, or gaining the, the funds I need to operate. And for that, I need uh, donors. So if I look at it through the lens of just donors, that, that side of my growth equation, um, then there's, uh, there might be an element of engagement that becomes essential because high, you know, high action donors uh, may be more willing if they are actually feeling, feeling connected with the mission. And that may be more strategically important than having a, or instituting a very transactional, transactional oriented kind of marketing uh, capability, which is more of what the exchange uh, stack looks like. And um, so I think depending on the organization, I would start with the question, what is, you know, what is the nature of growth uh, for, for us? And based on that, then kind of look at the, the framework and see, okay, what, what's more important. Now there are, in our work, we have more specific uh, tools to guide the decision of, of the choices, but that's a good place to start. The last thing I would say about that question, which is um, which you could also look at that framework as ways you can disrupt. So look at your peers. How is everybody competing? Is everybody competing on engagement, primarily engagement, and nobody is really doubling down on experience? That's the door you can go right into and disrupt the marketplace. I mean, that's what uh, Casper did for the mattress industry, right? The incumbents were all competing on basically a version of, uh, of engagement and exchange, and they came in and just eliminating pain points and disrupted the, the, the market. So think about it also as opportunities for you to differentiate and, and disrupt. Awesome. Thank you so much, Omar. Really do appreciate it. Thank you for your time, sharing your research with us today and your insight. Just Thank you so much. Th thank you everybody for giving me a few minutes of your day. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And um, if you have any other questions, refer to the article or just send us some, some questions our way. Awesome. Okay. And also thank you to our attendees. Um, thank you for taking the time out each and every Thursday to join us for Business Over Breakfast. We really do appreciate it. You all give such great questions, great comments um, following the session. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, just wanna share a couple of things with you all in preparation for our upcoming holiday. We'll be closing out November with Brian, with Ryan Hamilton, excuse me, next Thursday. Um, uh, but he will be sharing his market research in, on customer habits in a time of pandemic. Kicking off December, Andrea Dittman will be joining us for harnessing collaboration to reduce social class inequality. Just want to share a couple of our upcoming programs with you as well. Leading and Inspiring Change will kick off sep no, excuse me, November 16th, 18th. And 20th, we have financing and accounting for non-financial managers kicking off December 7th, December 9th through the 10th, and 14th through the 15th, we have um, executive decision-making and our managerial leadership program, which kicks off in January. For more information on those courses, please connect with us on LinkedIn, as well as our website, goizueta.emory.edu forward slash executive education.